Joining us now, Hans von Spakovsky of the Heritage Foundation. He serves as the Election Law Reform Initiative Manager and a senior, a senior legal fellow for the foundation. Thanks for giving us your time this morning. Sure. Thanks for having me. When you hear the arguments of the Trump campaign, particularly on issues of fraud in this election, what do you think of the claims they're making and what kind of evidence must they present to meet those claims? Well, you've got to produce evidence uh, that fraud has occurred. That often can be difficult because it can be difficult to detect. I mean, the one thing that people need to understand is that uh, unfortunately, the U.S. has a long history of election fraud. That's not me saying it. That's the U.S. Supreme Court back in 2008. Uh, and we need to take steps to make sure it doesn't happen. Is it massive and widespread? Uh, probably not. But it happens often enough uh, that it shows some of the vulnerabilities in, in the system. And, you know, for anyone who thinks it doesn't happen, well, you might want to talk to the residents of Patterson, New Jersey, uh, where four locals were just criminally charged by the uh, state attorney general with absentee ballot fraud, and they overturned a municipal election, had to hold a new election because of that fraud. Or, you know, they might want to talk to the residents of the 9th Congressional District of North Carolina, where two years ago a congressional race was overturned and seven uh, locals, including a political consultant, were arrested again for uh, I illegal uh, vote harvesting and tampering with absentee ballots. And uh, they had to hold a new election there, too. So it does happen. Have you seen any significant evidence of fraud in this campaign, particularly towards the president? Well, look, right now it's really too early to tell. Let me tell you what concerns me, though, is uh, transparency is fundamental to our uh, uh, democratic process. I mean, that's why in every single state, uh, there are state laws authorizing all of the candidates and all the political parties to have observers in the entire election process. They can be in the polls uh, watching and observing to make sure everything is being done correctly. And they're supposed to also be uh, in the downtown offices where the counting of ballots is occurring. And it, it, it concerns me when in cities like Detroit and Philadelphia, uh, GOP observers were locked out and not allowed in to see the processing, handling, and counting of absentee ballots. In Philadelphia, as, as you may know, uh, uh, the Trump campaign actually went to court and got a court order ordering election officials to allow observers in, and uh, election officials there defied the court order and still wouldn't uh, allow it. Um, that is a fundamental uh, violation of the principles of transparency that we have. And I would like to know why in the world they were engaged in that kind of behavior. I, you know, were they trying to hide something? We don't know because there weren't any observers in there to, to tell. For the legal arguments that you've seen from the Trump campaign, whether it be for counting ballots or otherwise, which do you think has the most, I guess, effort of making a, some type of significant uh, appearance in court, whether it be for the actual counting or because of state laws like Pennsylvania's, which allows right. the processing of ballots after the election day? Uh, probably their arguments are strongest in Pennsylvania. The reason for that is that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, stepped in and changed the laws uh, laid out by the state legislature. They extended the deadline for the receipt of absentee ballots from election day to several days after election day, they, they then also told election officials that even if there was no postmark on the envelope indicating that uh, it, it, so they didn't know whether it had been uh, uh, voted and mailed by election day, they still had to count the ballot. And then they also said they couldn't reject ballots even if the signature on the absentee ballot did not match uh, the signature of the voter on file. The problem with that is, is that the U.S. Constitution gives authority for setting the rules for federal elections to state legislatures, not state courts. If the state legislature in Pennsylvania wanted to set those kind of rules for absentee ballots, they're fully empowered to do so. But the courts are, can't do that. They don't have authority to do that. And I think uh, the Trump campaign potentially has a strong argument uh, they'd have to go to the U.S. Supreme Court with it that um, any ballots that were received after the state law deadline of Election Day uh, are invalid. Uh, so the Supreme Court took a look at this. Our previous guest talked about it with a 4-4 decision, right. but it didn't look at the merits of, of the actual case, if I understand it correctly. Can correct, correct. me if I'm wrong. 
Yes, no, that that's exactly right. What happened was the state legislature actually filed an emergency appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court asking for a temporary stay of uh, what the state Supreme Court had done. Uh, it was a 4-4 split because the empty seat had not yet been filled. And so therefore, the rules that the state Supreme Court set in place uh, uh, would stay in place for the election. But that does not prevent um, the campaign, or in this case, the state legislature, from going back to the uh, Supreme Court and saying, you now need to take the case on the substantive merits and make a decision. It may be too late. You know, if those ballots that were received after Election Day uh, were not segregated and have already been uh, counted and, and have joined the anonymity of the ballot box, e even if they got a positive decision from the Supreme Court, it, would, it might be too too late to do anything about it. Uh, we'll invite you to the conversation if you want to ask our guests questions. Uh, if you uh, support uh, Joe Biden, it's 202 If you support President Trump, it's 202 And 202 if you uh, supported another candidate or you didn't vote, you can text questions at 202 And Mr. Von Spakowski, as we were having that conversation, CNN reporter Caitlin Collins reporting that uh, there in Pennsylvania, uh, Joe Biden apparently taking the lead there by just over uh, 5,000 votes. Does that strengthen perhaps the case of the administration to go to the Supreme Court with these concerns which you highlighted? Well, it does depend if, if the number of ballots received after Election Day, in other words, uh, after the actual deadline set by state law, by the state legislature, if that number of ballots is larger than the margin of victory, yeah, I think it does make a stronger case uh, before the Supreme Court. Is there a point where the, the, the court case, or at least the legal challenges and things like that, is there a point in your mind where it affects actually determining how we resolve this year's election? Well, the one thing that uh, all of the judges and the courts know in this situation is that they are under a real time crunch to resolve uh, any questions that have been raised about the outcome. A as you probably know, the uh, Electoral College this year uh, is scheduled to meet on December 14th. So that's the date on which the electors who've been pledged to either Joe Biden or to uh, uh, Donald Trump um, are certified as uh, the winners, depending on the majority vote in the state, and they then meet at the state capitol and ca cast their actual uh, votes for president. So by December 14th, each state has to have resolved the outcome in their states. And so if there's any court actions, all of the judges know uh, they can't take weeks or months to make a decision. They have to act within days. Uh, to decide the merits of whatever case is in front of them. And so, and because of something when it comes to the electors themselves, what bounds, what binds the electors to actually go with what the state has determined and can people walk away from that? Yeah, that's, that's the issue of faithless electors. Uh, can an elector break the pledge that they make? Uh, for example, if you're a, a Democratic elector in most states, uh, you promise and pledge that you'll, you'll, vote cast your electoral college vote for uh, the democratic candidate if the democratic candidate wins a ma majority of the popular vote in the state uh, actually the u.s supreme court made a decision about that um, earlier this year there were two cases arising out of the last election the 2016 election out of colorado and the state of washington in which electors uh, who had pledged, I, I think in those cases, they had been actually pledged to vote for Hillary Clinton, broke their pledges and did not vote for Hillary Clinton. They did not vote for Donald Trump. They voted for other people that weren't even in the race. Uh, in the Washington state, uh, the state fined the uh, electors who broke their pledge. In Colorado, the secretary of state nullified their vote and replaced them with alternate electors. They sued saying, They've got independent uh, uh, ability to cast their ballot and that, and that states can't bind them that way. The Supreme Court disagreed. They said the states have constitutional authority um, to uh, uh, lay out how electors are chosen. And if they want to uh, put in a provision that an elector has to honor the promise or pledge they've made, states can do that.